All right, now we are masters of uh, the rep browse regime. Now let's get into our reputation regime. Uh, and actually, first, let me hide this video <laughs> and get this out of the way. So, uh, in our reputation regime, let's figure out, let's try to figure out the scaling of our viscosity scaling with m to the 3.4 and our diffusion scaling as m to the minus 2. Um, so, let's go ahead and figure out and develop a physical intuition and picture of what's happening in this rotation. So, in the rotation regime, um, we no longer have kind of this lack of entanglements. Um, we could actually instead envision a single polymer chain that's surrounded by fixed entanglements or these impenetrable topological obstacles um, through which our chains cannot move. So, um, and the other thing is, in the entanglement regime, we could kind of say that the distance between our obstacles is much, much smaller, or is much smaller than the length of our chain. So our chain's diffusion is going to be heavily influenced by these obstacles. So a nice picture is this. So here's our polymer chain right here. It has some, you know, distance or, you know, uh, some contour length, which is equal to an L, or even just your R squared and N distance. If it's in the melt, and to the one half L. This is gonna be much, much larger than kind of the distance here. D um, between these topological obstacles. So these are fixed obstacles. And realistically, um, these X's are really just kind of where our uh, our chain, our tube, or here, here's, you know, we, we can get a little ahead of ourselves. This is kind of our polymer of interest, and this red line are other polymers. And again, each of these X's corresponds to kind of an entanglement, where our polymer is being, again, interpenetrated, and we're impinging on kind of this excluded free volume. So these are fixed topological obstacles, i.e. entanglements, that are due to kind of, again, our steady getting, getting stuck, uh, and we can't kind of move through it, uh, and we need some kind of other force in order to kind of pull it out of the um, our stuck spaghetti. So that is kind of the physical picture of what's going on in the reptation regime. So we have these fixed topological obstacles that you can kind of see here that are going to constrain because now, my polymer previously, it would just kind of, my polymer would just move through this kind of viscous medium. You could kind of use an example of like walking through um, a field with grain and your arms are outstretched and you just kind of, but you know, your diffusion is slow, but you are kind of, you could just kind of move through that viscous, you know, field of uh, grain. But now you're walking through a field uh, that has forests and trees. And now you're going to have to adjust. So if there's, tree here, tree here, tree here. I'm going to have to adjust. I can't just walk with my arms outstretched. I'm going to have to, as I walk, go around this guy. I'm going to go around here, go around here. So it is going to affect kind of the diffusion. And so you can expect with these fixed, obstacle, fixed logical obstacles, my viscosity will increase and also my, uh, my diffusion will decrease dramatically. So let's see if that's the case and try to explain the scaling prior behavior. So um, our solvent, again, no longer featureless. We have the motion of our single particles highly constrained, again, due to the presence of entanglement. So higher viscosity, lower diffusivity, just as we kind of said. Um, the other way, and one of the ways you can kind of imagine or kind of deduce um, the type of motion that's going to be exhibited by these polymers is by imagining our polymer as constrained uh, in this kind of tube of free volume. So again, this tube of free volume is drawn throughout kind of the C of your top line. So if you look through here, let's look at this kind of structure. So this tube represents, again, the free volume that this polymer, again, through thermal fluctuations, access. And we draw the tube as thick as possible, where, again, we have enough free volume, but, again, we can't, you know, uh, basically this tube is, drew, uh, is drawn kind of just around where this polymer is going to kind of overlap. So we don't, again, we can't access that same area. So we need to make sure that our tube is drawn uh, such that our free volume doesn't overlap with the other chain's free volume. So we want to draw the tube as big as possible, but it's going to be constrained simply by these. You know, again, we can't cross over or into that area. We can't access that same, um, you know, again, two molecules can't occupy the same space. So that's how we're drawing this tube. So inside of our tube, we're able to kind of move um, somewhat freely. Again, our molecule has some free volume. Uh, we want to draw the tube as thick as possible excuse me, without overlapping uh, kind of those entanglements uh, in the sea of constraints. 
Uh, in, in, inside of this tube, our polymer can freely diffuse essentially in one dimension. So it is able to kind of move around freely in this uh, uh, kind of inside of our uh, tube effectively that we're drawing. Again, the tube is, or the uh, essentially that size of the tube depends on, again, the amount of free volume that the polymer can access. So that's gonna change, and again, depending on the, um, the size or the number of those topological entanglements. So we can approximate our uh, size of our coil as such, again, physicist model here, and we know that the contour length of our chain will also be, skipping ahead here, our length is also this Dn. Again, similar, just instead of N going here, our L is B, physicist model. Um, so our tube is all around our coil. So the tube contour length will be the same as my chain contour length. So if I have uh, my tube end-to-end -end distance will be the same as my chain end-to-end -end distance. Um, so if Z is the number of uh, tube segments and A is equal to the length of each segment, I'm going to just say this. Again, this contour length is equal to my kind of tube length. So the way that this polymer is going to move is the front of the tube, so this is at time t equals 1. Uh, so here, the polymer is going to move in this direction. So at some point, the front of the tube is going to move forward. So there's some free volume here. So the red polymer is going to move this way. Um, so it's going to access into some available free volume, and the back of the tube is going to be destroyed. So you can see here, this is our destroyed tube. Um, and this is, again, conservation of volume of our you know, tube. And this motion is referred to as reptation, kind of like a snake, right? You see kind of a snake that move forward, and it kind of undulates, and then the tail you know, it moves forward, the tail kind of, you know, uh, as it moves forward, the tail kind of um, moves along with it, and essentially you can kind of imagine like where that tail used to occur, uh, used to be. Now that uh, tube area is destroyed, uh, and now you created kind of this new tube green right here. So again, it's the state like play motion. Uh, and what we want to do again is going to continue and continue until your tube is completely destroyed, and you've accessed again other uh, site or this other you know you've created a whole new tube, and then the process repeats over and over again. So what we want to do is we want to find the time it takes. Um, for a tube to be completely destroyed and replaced by a new tube. And this is essentially the time it would take for a polymer to diffuse its own length. Um, so you could kind of imagine, once this tube is completely destroyed, our center of mass will move. Our center of mass is right here. Once that tube is completely destroyed, it will move basically some distance, you know, rg squared. Or rg squared, let's see. So one half, or, you know, again, radius of diffusion you know what we're uh, kind of working with there. Um, so we will look at that relationship in just a little. Uh, so the time uh, required for the formation of a new tube is this disengagement time. So it's the way that our entanglements, the time it will take for our entanglements to disengage, to, to relax flat. They will actually give us some insight into relaxation time as well. So inside the tube, again, free to diffuse within uh, the constraints of, again, the tube walls. So Inside the tube, the motion is going to be very, very similar to our browsers. So, um, again, uh, the polymer will be a little bit elongated because of the tube constraints, but we can zoom in uh, on one section, and then again, think about the time necessary for the polymer to diffuse completely outside of that. So, our diffusion, so just like in the Rouse regime, uh, our diffusion inside of our tube, uh, again, uh, and we want to kind of again, we want to figure out the time necessary for a polymer to completely diffuse out of the tube section, one tube section. And that's going to give us, again, the time for the creation or destruction of that tube that we talked about previously. So our diffusion inside the tube is going to be very similar, exactly the same as our Rouse diffusion. So you kind of see that expression, uh, again, that inverse relationship, V scales inversely N, and thus with M. Um, so we can see, again, we're just getting this one, dimen uh, one dimensional motion, polymer moving back and forth inside of that tube. Again, some radial movements, but pretty much, again, is that replication type of motion. So that's going to be described the diffusion inside the tube. But we want to know the time it's going to take for the coil to move its entire contour length. We want to see how long, if it moves back and forth randomly, one-dimensionally, inside of that tube, how long is it going to take to diffuse and create a whole new tube? So we need to know, uh, and that's going to be uh, the diffusive, uh, given by the diffusion of the Rouse regime. So let's figure that out. So if I want to diffuse x squared a distance, and again, to diffuse all the way outside of that tube, we know that tube has a contour length L, and that L is equal to N B. So we're going to use our Einstein expression, where we know that this distance squared is going to be 
proportional to some diffusivity times, you know, time or tau. Again, this is just the expression we looked at previously. Where are we at? Right. Oh, excuse me. Way back over here. Actually, in some of our previous lectures. Oh, excuse me. Ah. Right here. So just some diffusion time times. So again, Brownian motion. So let's go back to our equation here. So if we want to diffuse some length, some distance, L, so L squared, D, and T, uh, D is going to be, again, the diffusivity inside of a tube. So if we want to figure out what is tau, or the longer relaxation time, um, and it's also the disengagement time, uh, and again, it gets, again, again it's, it's this characteristic, it's the longest relaxation time, or the characteristic relaxation time in the rotation regime. We can see that this is going to scale like this. So remember, our relaxation time, tau, is going to scale, because uh, we know that, again, we know this relationship here, we know m is proportional to n, so tau is going to scale as n cubed, which is going to scale as m cubed. Excellent. And we're going to see in the next lecture when we get into mechanics that our viscosity is going to scale and will scale with our tau. So your viscosity scales with m cubed. Just like we saw at the very beginning of this lecture, this kind of perplexing 3.4. Again, not exactly uh, 3.4, but it's pretty close with some uh, hopefully um, straightforward kind of relationships and some assumptions. So incredibly, incredibly close, uh, very, very approximately correct, uh, giving us this uh, scaling behavior. Now, we found how, again, how viscosity scales with M. But what about the diffusion, the diffusivity? We saw that in our uh, curve, the diffusivity scales uh, as M to the minus 2. Well, let's see if that's uh, actually the case. So now we can have the time, this characteristic relaxation time, where the polymer has moved a distance, uh, again, that whole length. Um, but we could approximate this. Again, just like we kind of saw previously, if that polymer moves the full length of a tube, so if my polymer's in here and it's moved all the way out to kind of, let's say, just a tube in the next section here, it's equivalent to saying that my, uh, my polymer has moved a distance, the center of mass has moved an equivalent distance of the radius of gyration. So if I create my own uh, tube, I've moved a distance, this Rg squared, my radius of gyration squared. So if I go ahead and plug that in, I know that my d rep, my rotation, so if I want to look at that diffusivity, d rep, I just rearrange this expression. I know that tau scales as n cubed. I know that my uh, radius of gyration uh, is going to scale as what? So we know that rg squared is basically very similar to here in the melt. So we know that's nl squared. So n divided by n to the 3 we recover this expression. So again, in the reptation regime, we see that the diffusivity scales as m to the minus 2 or n to the minus 2. In the Rouse regime, n to the minus 1. So we obtain exactly that same uh, kind of idea, that same expression uh, that we kind of see in this graph. And it matches our, intu uh, our qualitative intuition as well. The reptation regime, that viscosity is going to be much higher, uh, and the diffusivity will be lower than in the Rouse regime. And it's all due to kind of these topological constraints, these permanent entanglements that slow down the diffusion uh, in our polymers and polymer dynamics. So the key thing uh, that you want to think about as we uh, uh, have how we derive this dereptation and our re longest relaxation time. So our longest relaxation time was based on the assumption again, Rouse motion in each tube segment, and then it's the time required for a polymer to slide through a tube equal to its own contour. So we zoomed out, and the coil moved through a tube equal to the contour length, and the entire center of mass must have moved distance approximately equal to the radius of gyration. So uh, again, moved a distance equal to its own size. So the motion in the tube was Rouse-like and one-dimensional, and the motion of the tube uh, itself, the tube, so the tube motion here, radius of gyration, it just moves kind of this distance r squared, you know, this r squared. So the tube is basically three-dimensional in a random walk. So again, this is kind of the key idea here. So that, that big contrast from the Rouse regime rotation 
is not the motion of the center of mass, but again, um, but the process by which that center of mass moves. So Rouse regime, any given segment can just do a random walk, no constraints. But in the reptation, we have these fixed topological entanglements, force limited 1D motion, and then that it's able to kind of move through and uh, basically the center of mass is able to kind of move as well. Excellent. So these two different views, lane scales, uh, motion of individual parts versus the motion of the collective, that is um, what makes reptation a very, very, very unique uh, and interesting uh, mode of motion. So now we're going to look and see how uh, we could kind of visualize or think about polymer polymer diffusion. So if we have different lengths of polymers, if we have different uh, kind of chemical effects, enthalpies, affinities, uh, and then we'll kind of go through one more kind of supplemental description of routes and reptation. So I will see you all next time. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye.